Welcome everybody to Learning Happy Hour. This is our million minute milestone. Hey, so we have actually passed the million minutes of, uh, of uh, material, which is, uh, which is really impressive and actually a little surprising. I didn't realize we'd work that hard. Anyway, I am Patrick Branley. I'm a senior technical trainer for Palo Alto Networks. With me is my co-host, Luke. Luke, will you introduce yourself? Yes, I'm Luke Teeters. I am a systems engineer for Palo Alto Networks. Welcome. We had, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> you finished? <laughs> so yeah, we I have did. a special <laughs> guest, <laughs> and that is Mitch Densley. Mitch, introduce yourself. Hey, everybody. Uh, Mitch Densley. I've been around these halls uh, a while now. Uh, I'm an SE currently, and happy to be back on Learning Happy Hour. Thank you. All right, so end of the year. It's the holiday season. We want to reflect a little bit on where we've been and where we're going and maybe talk a little, uh, little shop as well so that we have a little meat to this, this particular episode. But first of all, I just want to uh, talk a little about Learning Happy Hour. And Mitch, I'd like you to give the history. And for those of you who haven't been watching since the beginning, Mitch is one of the, uh, the originators, the, uh, the original OG host of uh, Learning Happy Hour along with Another, uh, uh, well, former colleague, Jason, he's off on in different, different adventures, Evers. but uh, anyway, Mitch, tell us about it. So we were, Jason and I uh, were sitting around one evening uh, talking about ways to increase engagement with our customers. We were finding that the videos we were putting out on our live community YouTube channel had a lot of interest, a lot of attention but it didn't give us an opportunity to go deep into topics and really elaborate on this or that. And the idea of college night classes came to us and we thought, hey, night classes people do while they're working, it's interesting. We could make it like a training class. We ended up just going recorded. We were thinking about live events in the evening, but we did an hour to start with and we dove deep. We had a lot of fun making it. The interest was pretty high. And so we were told, yeah, keep it up until you screw it up. We'll let this see how long it goes. And here you are, a million minutes. That's pretty impressive that you guys have uh, done so well. So congratulations. I think you actually made more content than we've made so far. But ours is quality. <laughs> quality I don't know. I think, I think you guys have beat us. So. Have we now? I, you know, I haven't. I, uh... I do know that I did uh, accidentally uh, repeat something you taught once, so, and actually repeated the same error that you made, so that was kind of fun. Oh, now I want to right, follow up later. Out. I don't know what I screwed up. <laughs> I think calling. It was <laughs> anyway, so, um, in fact, I think I asked you about it, and you're like, I already did that. I'm like, oh, I just. <laughs> so, it's a big topic, a little, so that was repeating. Awesome. Anyway, so, um, yeah, and what we what we did with it. Well, first of all, actually, let me let me go to you, Luke. So, how did you? How did you become a part of it? That's a funny story because I was a customer actually, and I was um, hired by Palo, and I was sent to a boot camp in, at our central headquarters in California, and uh, I was asked if I would be interested in joining the show, and so I said absolutely. So that's kind of how I fell into this. Uh, yeah, position, fun I fact: uh, Luke and I have never met in person. <laughs> We've only met on. We have not. Yeah, not yet. <laughs> Uh, pandemic probably hurt that chance for a little while, but, uh, yeah, for me, I was actually just jealously watching Mitch and Jason make this show that I want to be a part of. And then, um, both of them went and did different things. And so it was left, the vacuum was there and I, I went and jumped in. So, uh, I just kind of stole it, I guess. <laughs> so, but it's been really you did fun. wonderful. You were the successor. Yeah, that's, that's true. Now, I, I was asked to do it. I didn't just walk in and say, give it, but uh, I would have, but I didn't have to. So it's been great. It's been a lot of fun. And just a little bit more about Learning Happy Hour. It has been, well, it kind of started first, like actual happy hour. And then we were told, don't drink. <laughs> so we had to stop that. And really- Water. Water. Yeah, coffee. I just got my uh, you know, drink here. But anyway, so- um, then it kind of turned into this uh, shorter form that we've been doing with which kind of talk about a topic, but it has endured. And so uh, expect some, some changes and some big things for 2022. Uh, more to come. 
uh, as we as we go further into the year. So, with that, can I, um, if I may, you know, I miss the show. It was so much fun making these things. And since you brought me back on, I really have a hankering to share something. Do you mind? No, no, go ahead. You sure? Okay. Um, let me share my screen here really quick because I my life has been consumed good or bad, by the log four shell problems or log for J. If you're one of those that say log fours, I'm sure some people would agree with you. I don't, right? It's log for J. Um, but it, we've had some really amazing briefings recently on how this vulnerability works. And to be honest, I don't think everyone really understands what the risk is, right? It, you might think, well, if I am blocking inbound traffic to my servers that are vulnerable, I'm fine, right? Wrong, and here's why. So I have a very simplified analogy on uh, how this works, right? And it's not a, a direct analogy, it's, it's simplified. But essentially, uh, we're all in COVID times right now. So the QR codes that you see at restaurants are everywhere. People are familiar with them. I thought one day, and me and a friend were chatting, how funny might it be? Uh, it's hard to, to laugh at the, uh, the, the unfortunate events of others, but, or how about this? How possible would it be, too easy, I think, for an attacker to go to a restaurant, scan their QR code, download their PDF of their menu, uh, tweak that PDF by putting some malware into it, host it somewhere, and then redeploy uh, QRs with links to the malicious menu PDF back in the restaurant somewhere, who would notice? who would know, and then now you've got a bunch of people grabbing this malicious menu just by visiting the restaurant, right? So it's evil. Risk, it's very it's, evil. I know, it's so devious. <laughs> don't, don't be evil. Well, <laughs> where this relates back to the whole log for shell problem, think of a vulnerable log for shell server like the phone, right? You hold the camera app up, it, it says, hey, do you want to click on this link? Oh, it's the phone, and it auto clicks the link. So. The QR is just an analogy for a malicious JNDI command or instruction that is something a log4j server legitimately looks for and responds to. But if I'm malicious, I can ask uh, via JNDI this server to phone home to me and grab my malicious payloads or do other activities that you may not want. Uh, so as an attacker, I don't have to target the server directly. I just generate traffic that will get logged in any way. I could go to the URL uh, search field for a website. I could go to the login prompt for a website. I could uh, generate a bunch of uh, forged login credentials that fail off in a authentication log. Oh, and they just so happen to have this JNDI string, right? So I send traffic such to a system that logs it. That log floats throughout the ecosystem, through middleware servers, through whatever logging, uh, syslog servers you might have until it gets parsed or read by a vulnerable server. And now my malicious string is gonna be acted upon as this server phones home to me. And then I can have it do all kinds of bad stuff. So far we've seen instances of ransomware. We've seen secondary payloads containing cobalt strike. Um, and these tactics these attackers are using are evolving daily, right? So it's not that you just block all incoming traffic and you're safe. That's not how it works, right? Because people visit a website, they generate uh, traffic or do some action that generates a log. They would have to have some awareness or good guessing as to what could I do wrong on this system or this site to generate a log. Anyway, that, that log contains my malicious action and then that server phones home for secondary payloads or additional instructions or whatever. And it, in my example, I use JNDI LDAP. That was some of the original ways people were exploiting this, but now they're, they're doing like RDP calls and HTTP calls all after that initial JNDI. So this isn't over. Um, and the fact that it's so easy to exploit and anyone can do it. High school kids are trying it out now. I think Luke, Luke do you have an example of this as well? No, it's funny you say that because um, think of other ways of inputting string, emails. I even saw yeah. on Twitter a certificate authority um, CSR. So if you could get this input anywhere 
and the server is vulnerable, think of the chaos that will ensue. So basically, um, you know, everyone's trying to patch this right now. I mean, if you're on Twitter and you search, you know, log4j hashtag, it's it's a constant thread of, hey, have we thought of this? Hey, have we thought of that? And it's 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 ongoing right now. So if you have any skin in the game in the cybersecurity realm, um, it is a massive problem. So, you know, I see a lot of clever, I see a lot of cleverness out there on Twitter saying, hey, have we, have we tried this? Um, the, you know, the certificate signing request, I was like, oh my God, oh, like, genius. Or, or an email. I'm gonna send you an email with this string and it's going to be logged. And the server that logged it now beacons out to my, uh, my server. Yep. Yeah. So here's something else that, that we're seeing a lot of on Twitter. Um, what people are <clears throat> doing is they're inputting this string and they're, and they're trying to get like something as simple as a DNS query, right? I'm going to input the string to all the servers that I could possibly submit data into. If I receive a beacon back to my DNS A record that I'm using for testing purposes, that's a vulnerable server. Now I'm going to go back and I'm going to actually do a malicious input and try to get some sort of payload onto that on, onto that server. So this is a massive problem. And another thing is we're thinking outside in. Yeah. What about inside? What if I'm inside? I'm on the Wi-Fi. There's no threat at... inside. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, that's, I that's can go for hours. Thing. Like, you know, I, I'm really uh, creative. I'm a musician. I like to, you know, create stuff. And I'm just thinking like, oh my God so many ways of putting this string everywhere so wait i i i'd heard somewhere someone had renamed their iphone with this yes. string but you're right yes. if i name my phone and i hop on somebody's guest wi-fi that string is now logged by that guest wi-fi system i didn't it even thought of worse. that yeah. it gets worse the person who named their iphone that that string uh -huh. the icloud server connect to their dns uh so it's that bad. It is that bad. It's not, this is not. <laughs> it's a yeah. Swiss army knife. I mean, it is it's bad. Like, let's try the spoon now. Let's try the fork. Let's see what else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is wow. insane. Now I want to go back to something you said a second ago, Luke, you said that, um, well, let me tell you how I thought I heard you say it, uh, or I'll restate it. I had heard you say that people were doing scans or like passing these strings out to just do like reconnaissance via a DNS server response. And then once they got positive hits for systems they knew were compromised, then they did a different right. type of attack. Is that what you said? Right. Yeah. I mean, like what I was seeing a lot of on Twitter over the weekend when this first was announced was people were, there's tools out there where you could basically spin up a unique DNS a record on a server that will tell you if anything is trying to reach out to it. So basically it's a click of a button. Now you have a unique DNS um, uh, A record that exists on the public internet. So you basically spray this string, this JNDI string everywhere. And if you see it come back with a result, you know you just told that server to do a DNS request and it did it. Now you know it's vulnerable. So now I'm gonna go craft the actual malicious payload to, hey, go out and download this or do some you know malicious activity that, you know, a simple DNS request, you know, the fact that I could tell it to do that is is really bad. So that's yeah, that's what I was seeing on Twitter. Okay, because yeah, I was seeing... the normal. Go ahead, sorry. Well, I thought somebody had had probed my Global Protect portal with a malicious JNDI string, and they had done this lower upper percent dollar sign business to try and obfuscate it. So if I'm looking in my logs for the keyword L D A and P, I wouldn't find it because it's got this upper lower reference. But what you just basically highlighted is uh, the serious attackers probably aren't trying to obfuscate. They're masquerading as scanners that are pseudo legitimate. And then once they see a positive infection or vulnerable server, then they alter their TTP in a way that not everyone knows about. They're not beaconing that. And then they target it at just that one system. So if your preventions are all built around the, the scanning and the beaconing, you're totally not looking at what a, a real attacker would do once they have a confirmed vulnerable server. Is that what you're saying? Right. Yeah. It's like whack-a-mole basically. And again, guys, like, you know, this is outside in, right? Yeah. I mean, that's like, that's the easy stuff, right? I mean, I can go out and spray the internet, but what if I physically have access inside and I pop, 
you know, uh, UPS that's on the network, or I pop, you know, an IoT device or something like that that's vulnerable to this. That's my big fear is, you know, this is going to be up for years, right? This is by no means going to end. This is going to be an issue for many years to come because imagine IoT devices on the network. There's so much, right? You know, like I said before, I was a customer customer before I came to Palo, right? So I was actually boots on the ground doing day to day operations. There's so much on the network that no one knew about. It just it's just a reality, right? There's cameras, printers, people set it and forget it. And, you know, that's why they're, you know, IOT is such a big um, focal point right now in the industry. It's like IOT, it's, it's expanding so rapidly. And they say, oh, it's not going to get patched. It might not ever get patched. <laughs> so, you know, you basically have to yank it off the network. So it, it the long story short, I mean, like I've been following this since it uh, was first announced and discovered in every single hour. Every single minute, someone's trying something new. They're getting clever. They're obfuscating the strings. They're bypassing, um, you know, prevention methods. So again, you know, it's just it's just going to continue. So this is definitely a current happenings uh, in 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 the cyberspace. I was thinking even last night, laying in bed, thinking about this as as one does, right? I'm sure you all do the same. Um, I do. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, like, what if I took a malicious JNDI call and passed it to a Windows process such that I blue screen the OS and then I send the crash report to Microsoft and see if when they parse the blue screen, they see that JNDI screen and they phone about home back to me? They can just give somebody <laughs> an idea. Yeah, so. I mean, that's, that's no, I a it. potential vector. It sure. could be anything, right? I go sign up for an, a newsletter. I put that string in on somebody's website. I go launch a tech case with your favorite competitor, right? And then now they're compromised. So anytime user input is select or is received, bad stuff could happen from this. And it's not like, I mean, it's like, and it's unlike a SQL injection, right? Or cross-site scripting, because there's a finite set of actions uh, that you can do in a SQL injection and, and a cross-site scripting attack, and those go someplace specific. This stuff goes possibly lots of places because it's a log. We've never worried about logs before. And so we hand logs around like they're candy internally, and you know now everything's infected. It, it's scary. It really is. Two things. There's an entire meme site for LogForge so you, there's a, you know, I'll find it before the end of this episode and we'll put a link below. It's hilarious. You know, um, yeah. I log everything. God, I log everything. Like it's, <laughs> it's hilarious. <laughs> like, you know, like it's a positive, it's a bad thing. Uh, the other thing is none of those examples I liked. The like, the one that I liked the most was the guy that was patching it with a vulnerability. That's the one that I liked. <laughs> Some, someone actually crafted uh, to, you know, you're exploiting a server to go patch yourself. Right. So I, I did see that. That was hilarious. So I, I, all jokes aside, I thought that one was kind of cool. That's innovative for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I just, yeah. I mean, just the versatility of this is, uh, is frightening. It really is. So, right. so take it seriously. Yes. And uh, when you get patches, patch your stuff, please. Uh, right. They don't call stuff. it a patchy That's... for nothing. Right. So this is just one more. <laughs> And, and <laughs> we're here, you know, a week before uh, Christmas holiday and Apache just this morning basically said, yeah, we got another version of LogForge coming out. It's 2.1.7. Um, and it's just, you know, we're probably going to be up to 50 before this is all over. Um, if yeah. That. yeah. You know, it makes you think right. you could actually have a job title of Apache. It's like cookie when you're out on the, on the trail. The one oh, I get it. The chef. Just be that's patchy. Cool. That's all. That's all they do is just go <laughs> patch everything and be up. To I'm sure some of our customers watching this right now feel like they are Mr. Patchy. Constantly Probably, going yes. around. Update, update, update. Yeah, yeah. Patchy, you're our hero. <laughs> hey, guys, <laughs> look at the bright side. All the cybersecurity practitioners out there just got a new resume line item. Responded to LogForge. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Years from now, we'll ask, where were you when LogForge hit? So. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I we're joking about, it, but I feel, like feel bad because there's probably some people who've really just had something really terrible happen because of this. So I, uh, I've I've been talking to customers this week who haven't slept in days because they're just up all night scanning, yeah. and patching, and you know it is whack a mole, as Luke said. It's yeah. it doesn't end. <sighs> well, and cloud is not. That's like this isn't like a private cloud, public cloud argument at all. It's everywhere even right, right. like uh amazon's fargate I, I heard had some vulnerabilities like aws has been doing this for the past several days because 
they're finding one thing, they fix it, takes a reboot, you get affected, something else happens, you know, so there, it's a cascade effectively. I always wonder too, whenever a new vulnerability comes out, I just wonder how long was somebody using it before we ever knew it was there? You know, right. that's always well, kind of a scary thought too. So. Uh, in one of the briefings I got this morning, someone had discovered it back in November, disclosed it to the Apache Foundation, and then it became publicly known early December uh, after uh, an actual, someone was exploiting it. So someone disclosed it, someone exploited it, and then it became publicly known. See. So yeah, there's no telling how long it was known before that right. big exploit. Yeah. Well, Sad. when you're on the front lines, you just always got to assume somebody out there is smarter than you and just stay vigilant. That's how it goes. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, that was a great discussion. Very interesting and uh, hopefully very helpful to all of you watching. So if you haven't, uh, go ahead. to that point, right? Uh, if you are still battling Log4J and, or Log4Shell, uh, Palo Alto Networks has some CV, uh, sorry, uh, some really good mitigation documentation that involves yeah. any one or all of our products, and then documentation around how to mitigate without involving any of our products. We'll put the links down. Yeah, we'll the link that in the show notes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so check those out. That they don't get old. Um, this problem is not going to go away. So even if you're watching this nine months later, check it out because the guidance uh, is is being updated continually. This is not over. All right. Well, thanks so much, Mitch. It was great having you. Michael, Luke, and it was as a always, pleasure being you. with you both. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, you're very welcome. Hopefully, there'll be more in the future. So cool. All right. Well, everybody, uh, I hope you have a happy and safe holiday. And if you're out there on the front lines dealing with this, good luck. <laughs> Godspeed. <laughs> so, all right. All right. Well, then, for all of us, thanks. Take care. Be safe. See you again probably next year. Looking forward to it. <laughs>